Hey, I'm David. I'm a graduate student here from Emory University, where I'm in the neuroscience program, and I work in Sam Sober's lab. We live in the biology department there. And I'm here to tell you about this library I've been developing, hybrid vocal classifier. It's not even in beta yet, because I have this day job of like finishing my PhD. And then I code at night. I don't know if anyone here knows what that's like. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll, I'll tweet out the slides later if you want to look at them in the comfort of your own home. So I'll tell you what hybrid vocal classifier is, and then I will have to immediately explain what our science is, because it doesn't make sense without me explaining that. Uh, it's basically a machine learning package that lets you automate some analysis. We do in our field some like data labeling. And so I'll tell you what some of the machine learning methods are. And then I'll show you the results I've gotten so far. Spoiler alert, uh, neural nets win. And of course, since I'm a neuroscientist, when I say neural nets, I mean a statistical model with a lot of parameters that bears only a superficial resemblance to the actual brain. <laughs> Hashtag shots fired. <laughs> Somewhere, Terry Sanofsky just put me on the secret, secret NIPS blacklist. Uh, so the hybrid vocal classifier is not Shazam for songbirds. You don't install it on your phone and then go outside and identify like robins and grackles. Think of it more as like speech to text for songbirds, right? So it lets you apply labels to the elements of their song. And, and I'll tell you why would, we would do that. Uh, and to do so, I have to explain our work. We're a neuroscience lab. And we study how the brain learns speech and similar motor skills. So think of like playing the piano or uh, shooting basketball hoops, anything that you learn by imitation, and then you perfect by practicing it thousands of times. So similarly, songbirds learn their vocalizations by social interaction from uh, a tutor, like in a lot of species. It's a son learning from the father. And they have to, just like us, be exposed to this vocalization during a sensitive period in development. If they aren't, then they can never acquire it as well as they would have. And then they go on to perfect their vocalizations through a process that we call sensory motor learning. So it's just like it sounds. When they first start to sing, they don't do it very well. But somehow the brain uses sensory feedback to change the motor commands that it sends out. And what we want to understand is what is the algorithm in the brain that lets us acquire some motor skill and then maintain that like expert level of performance. So to do that, we look at bird song. This is what it looks like to orient you to this speech bubble here, because songbirds speak in speech bubbles. Uh, this is a spectrogram. Yes, I used jet. Some, <laughs> somewhere Nathaniel Smith is groaning in Berkeley. Um, but that's what's the default in our MATLAB GUI. So don't hold it against me. This is the this is like frequency on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis, just to orient you. And these bright spots are the actual syllables. And then we can just arbitrarily apply labels to them. And the way that we find them in the song is we look for like threshold crossings of the amplitude. So that's what you're seeing on this bottom plot. So these these red horizontal lines are the, like the actual segments that we pick out and then label. And I just want you to know, like uh, each bird song is similar to the song of its tutor, but we, even within a species, the, the songs can be very different. Uh, so just because I call some syllable in Bengalese finch song one C, that doesn't mean that Bengalese finch number two, if I call one of its syllables C, that they're necessarily the same, right? And the, and the point here is just that we need something that's, that can generalize, like a machine learning algorithm that can generalize across a bunch of different songs especially if we want to like, apply this to different species. And just to give you a brief taste of the kind of experiments that we do so you understand like, why I would want to do this, why we would want to do this, here's like some syllable C, right? And the bird will sing it thousands of times a day, and we can measure the pitch if it's a pitchy syllable. And then what we see is that there's actually a distribution of pitches that it sings. So even though it's learned the song and it can uh, perform it uh, you know, with very little variability every, every time, there's still some noise left in how it sings. So there's like a distribution there. And because of this, you can target that distribution with computer software uh, that does magic computer software stuff under the hood. 
And then if you punish some part of the distribution with white noise, the bird can actually shift what it sings. So that's what this would look like. I know uh, it's hard to perceive because of the jet color scheme, but this big red thing is the blast of white noise. And this is kind of like a cartoonized version of the results from one of these experiments. So you can see the bird sings this certain syllable like thousands of times a day. And then when we turn on the white noise, it shifts the distribution of pitches it sings up and it stays up until we turn the white noise off again. And this was surprising because we used to think that they learned their song and then they were done, which is kind of weird because they have a lot of real estate in their brain dedicated to learning the song and it just hangs around once they're adults. And maybe this is why it turns out that they can actually change their song as adults. You know, why would that be useful? Why, why would they still need to have plastic song? This is sort of uh, a similar experiment. These are tiny bird headphones. <laughs> yeah, that's the cutest slide. Uh, it's mandatory that we include this image in any talk about our lab. Uh, so that shifts the pitch of the bird's song in real time. So we auto detune the bird. <laughs> and <laughs> right, so if you shift the pitch up, the bird over a number of days will sing lower. So that tells us that it's actually actively using sensory feedback to, to match its, its output to its expected output, right? It has this like template in its mind, and if it sings something different that doesn't match up, it'll correct for that, right? So they're, they're actively using sensory feedback to maintain this motor skill. And we know that we do the same thing. So you can put headphones on me and shift my, the pitch of my voice, and I will correct, even if it's like an imperceptible pitch shift over hundreds of trials, I will, my brain will correct for that. So that gives us some idea of how the brain maintains motor skills. But, so going back to this plot, like each one of these dots is hundreds of data points uh, from two hours of song per day. We can't actually label all the song that they sing, even though we want to, to have some idea of like what's going on in the brain moment to moment. Even if we fill the lab with undergraduates, the undergraduate algorithm cannot label all of the song. And we want them to have a more enriching, enriching research experience, right? instead of like watching Netflix and typing the same five letters over again all day. So people have tried to address this issue in different ways. Sound Analysis Pro is a really important piece of software in our field. It's open source uh, and it's, it's driven the field forward. But it, does, it avoids labeling. It's mostly used to give you similarity scores in practice. That's how most people use it. And what that means, as you're seeing over on the right here, is that you line up some spectrograms and you take a cross correlation of whatever features you're looking at and that spits out the similarity score. And that lets you say like how similar is the tutor song to the juvenile that learned from it or something like that, right? So, so we can't use this to do the kind of analysis we do where we wanna look at you know, every rendition of syllable C all day. And some people have built libraries on top of this that, that use its output to do clustering, but the clustering doesn't work well for some bird species, for example, ours. And, and uh, the species we work with, again, is Bengali's finches, right? People have proposed using different machine learning algorithms on Bengali's finch song, K nearest neighbors, support vector machines you might have heard of. People have come out with the convolutional neural network to classify the song syllables. And I'll, I'll introduce these algorithms a little bit just to make sure we're all on the same page. But, but the point here is that uh, it's hard to compare these different machine learning methods, right? Not all of the software is open source. When it is, it might not all be well documented. And there's very little in the way of a publicly available repository of data to benchmark this on. Again, I'm sure no one in the room has ever experienced anything like this. Uh, that was my third joke in the talk, thank you. <laughs> okay, so hybrid vocal classifier tries to address these issues. It's pure Python. It's a thin veneer of my crappy code surrounding the NumPy SciPy stack. Uh, so it implements support vector machines in k-nearest neighbors and scikit-learn and neural nets using Keras. Uh, it is hopefully easy to run, so it just consumes configuration files written in human-readable YAML. And along with it, we've released a large data set of hand-labeled data that's all nicely segmented song with days full of data points so you can benchmark to your heart's content. 
And the goals are to make it easy to label song in an automated way. So I heard the three-liner was in right now. So here's my three-liner of code. It's actually more like a four-liner with many hours of waiting for your computer to run and then staring at plots. But, but the point is it tries to make it as easy as possible to do this analysis and also make it easy, again, just to compare these different proposed methods and maybe try out some new machine learning methods. So what was previously proposed? K nearest neighbors is one example. So the Troyer lab is at UT San Antonio and they have their whole software package up online. It uses K nearest neighbors. Just in case you've never seen this, the way it works is if you're some new data point like this circle here and I want to assign a label to you, I take a vote of all your nearest neighbors and then whoever's in the majority, I say that that's what you are. So in this case, there's one square and two triangles, so I would say that you're a triangle. And the secret sauce in my K nearest neighbors features that I use, right? So this is like in feature space that you're finding your neighbors. Uh, for some reason, using duration of the preceding and following syllables makes it a very competitive algorithm. Think of this as like a poor man's hidden Markov model. Another group proposed using support vector machines and just Again, to give you an intuitive sense of how this works, you, the algorithm finds a, uh, a decision boundary that maximizes the margin between the groups that you're trying to separate. And the features that they used were previously used on like, large data sets for, for doing uh, something like identifying genres of music. And then last but not least, there's the convolutional neural net. This is a pretty standard convolutional neural net. I don't have time to go into the architecture, but the thing that's a little bit different about it is that the, the top layer that is a convolutional layer, think of the filter as, as a window that just slides along the whole spectrogram and, and tries to segment out the syllables. And so this is kind of like the image segmentation talk, if you saw that earlier, except that it's like a sliding window moving along. And this paper did everything right, so their code is all open, and they put out a repository of some song. Uh, the, the neural net is actually written in the Java framework, so I'm trying to translate it to Keras so that maybe it's easier for people to test out. And so back to hybrid vocal classifier, the way that it works basically is to spit out learning curves, and you'll see examples of these in a second. So this is where you'll have like accuracy on the y-axis of your predictions from your models and then training data on the x-axis. So ideally, as you give your algorithm more training data, the accuracy should go up. But what I want, what, what a generic Songbird researcher wants is the best model for the least amount of hand-labeled data. So that's what you are looking for in these plots. And then some of the machine learning methodology, it's using five-fold cross-validation but then I'm taking each fold from my training set and I'm grabbing N songs from within that fold because I'm trying to sort of approximate, you know, if I was in the lab and I just labeled the first three songs the birds sang, what kind of accuracy would I get from that? And then the accuracy is the, the average accuracy across all the syllables, across the, all the classes or elements in the bird's song because I want them all to be equally well labeled. And then, this is not a super clean analysis. I'll put the, the Jupyter Notebook up on, on my repo so you can judge my uh, dirty data. But once I do it with clean data, I think that I can use this analysis. So this is like my proof of concept. I'm fitting, think of this as like exponential decay. You'll see an example of this kind of curve. And then I get these fit parameters. There's like the tau, that's the time to asymptote that it reaches the asymptote and then the accuracy at asymptote. You'll see that in a second. So here's just an example from one bird. So this is a rerun from last year on my poster. Sorry if you saw this already. The take home message here is if you use a radial basis function, you can rescue support vector machines and they do as well as K nearest neighbors. And this might not be super surprising to you if you've done a lot of machine learning. But again, the point here is that you know, it wasn't easy, easy previously to compare these and see which one was, how each one was doing. And then I implemented this convolutional neural network 
And again, maybe not surprisingly, it does better than even the support vector machine that's been tweaked. But you know, if you are somebody in the field, in, in our subfield of neuroscience, and you, want, you don't have a GPU, for example, you want to know, can I do good enough with a support vector machine? Well, this makes it possible for you to test that. OK, so here's my proof of concept analysis. Uh, now that I've done this, I'm officially a data scientist. <laughs> so, or not, you can send me uh, angry emails if you disagree. But these, these are the fit lines. And, and uh, I, I think even if I do this with, with pretty data, the, the result will still ho hold that uh, convolutional neural networks win. So that's what I've got so far. And then future work is to look at uh, networks that can do segmentation. So, you know, this package is pretty much at the point where it will work for birdsong most of the time, but as soon as you start doing the kind of experiments I showed you where there's noise in the spectrogram, it actually messes up that segmentation. And so things like Kaner's neighbors don't work because they can't, you know, you need to have something that can segment cleanly before you can get features for those algorithms to use. So that is what I'm working on now. Stay tuned for those results. And now I have to thank everyone. Uh, thank you to SciPy for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thanks to the organizers. I think Jill Cowan is actually the secret mastermind that's running the whole show. But thank you to everybody. Thank you, Sarah and Gil, for finding time to drop by and see me at PyCon. Thank you, Sober Lab, my science family. I love you. Thank you, Bio and Comp NS. That's our like, computational neuroscience group in our department who gave me lots of good advice on this talk. And if, last but not least, Jonah Queen, who's the all-time reigning champion of labeling songbird syllables. So without him, we wouldn't have our open repository. And thanks to funding sources, of course, too, who let me do all this cool work. And that's what I got. <laughs> And I'll take questions if anybody's got any. Oh, also thank you, Scott, who's about to ask me a question <laughs> and who gave me advice when uh, we did practice talks yesterday. Hey, Scott. <laughs> it happened to me, too. <laughs> and you'd never expect that at a Python conference, would you? <laughs> uh, so nice talk. Good job. Thank you. Uh, I did want to ask, so you mentioned that the, um, that a syllable from songbird of species A is not a, the same as, uh, no, no, a syllable from songbird A from a certain species is not the same as the difference, the same syllable from a different songbird of the same species. Mm -hmm. does, it, does that mean that the, uh, does it mean that like birds of different communities have different languages? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're just saying, hey, I'm a bird. <laughs> That's uh, my boss's joke. He's mentored me well. Um, so, but they do have dialects, right? So like some of the first work that was done uh, around Berkeley showed that like if you go a little bit north, then white-throated sparrows, I hope I'm getting the species name right, sound a little bit different than the, the, the population that's farther south. So, so there can be variation in song within species, and then there's greater variation across species. So again, like we need something that's the algorithms that work across a whole bunch of different bird song. So are there any messages besides, hey, I'm a bird? Yeah, uh, they, they sing in different contexts, and they also can vocalize, the, not with learned vocalizations, but they have calls that they can, that can mm -hmm. signal different things. So you might have heard of like, like uh, some different some work with monkeys where they can signal like that's a snake or that's a that's an eagle right so they, they have calls like that cool thank you yeah I, I can talk for hours about random songbird facts as well <laughs> <laughs> i was wondering how robust the algorithm the classification algorithm is to changes in the speed of the songbird vocalization oh yeah that's a good question uh, that hasn't been tested yet, but uh, hopefully it will be soon. Uh, you know, and, and I know people are working on similar, similar ideas. So birds can actually sing at different rates within a species, 
And there's some, some idea that that might be actually genetically encoded. So, so that's a good point. I should follow up on that. Hey. So the bird with the Beats headphones, uh -huh. uh, what, uh, when you lowered their pitch, uh -huh. when you lowered their pitch, did it cause other birds to sing lower as well in the area? Or what happened to them? Oh, yeah. Kind of curious. That's a good question. So usually in, in, in these experiments, they're, they're not with other birds. Um, but, but we do know, like, along the same lines, you know, if you're in an in a urban area, right, then a lot of the songbirds will actually sing higher pitches at higher amplitude to, to be heard over just the random noise in the environment. So I don't know if it would be like socially transmitted to, to induce other birds to sing. We think that's mostly just due to like the sensory feedback that they're using. That's a good question. Anybody else? Okay, but yeah, I will totally just random, randomly ramble for hours about songbirds, so. I think that's why Sarah should usher me off the stage. <laughs> Thank you again.